as always. OK. Let's talk about how things can get a little bit more complicated. If I make a rigid device <coughs> and I use an incompressible fluid, then everything that we have done is correct and all of the formalism is instantaneous. You'll recall that the governing equation we used, I got rid of du dt, I said it was steady. And the assumption that we've used is the response of the system to any changes in external stimuli and to any changes in the boundary conditions is instantaneous. It's just P is equal to Q times R. But if you go in the lab and you take a microfluidic device and you change the hydrostatic head, you will see the flow change, but you will not see it change instantaneously. You'll always see this exponential decay to the equilibrium solution. Why is that? Well, the reason is because, although we may have a mathematical formulism that says that things are rigid, the real world is never rigid. No microfluidic device ever has a level of rigidity that allows you to use this sort of instantaneous analysis. And so we need to talk about compliance. And I think there are three basic ways to, or three different aspects of compliance in a microfluidic system. <clears throat> if you envision that this is our microfluidic device and we have an inlet and an outlet, we've connected this to some pump of some sort. <clears throat> we have some channel that connects this inlet to this outlet. Again, if it's perfectly rigid, the response is instantaneous. But it's never instantaneous. So what are the key things that cause this system to not respond instantaneously? Well, the key thing is that the volume of the system is not fixed. And it cannot be fixed really in three different ways. First, if the container is not rigid, if it's flexible, as I increase the pressure, right, I turn my pump on on the inlet, I'm increasing the pressure in the system. If you envision the channel itself as a balloon, if I apply a pressure, the pressure goes up, the balloon expands, and the volume of the system increases. So as soon as the walls of the system are flexible, we end up getting compliance. <coughs> now, if you make your device out of silicon or glass or rigid polymers like PMMA, polycarbonate, xeno, or other, other cyclic olefin copolymers, those are really all effectively rigid for our purposes. But if you make your device out of polydimethyl siloxane, which is extraordinarily common in microfluidics, these walls, it's an elastomeric material, it's relatively soft. And so when you apply a pressure, the system deforms, the volume increases. <clears throat> the second thing is that it's extraordinarily difficult to remove all of the bubbles from a microfluidic device. So of course, if you're very careful about this, you can do it. But if you're working in the lab with a regular old device, you will have some bubbles in there. So those bubbles now are effectively very, com very flexible walls, right? You have water. It's surrounded maybe by a rigid plastic wall or a silicon wall or a glass wall. But in there somewhere, there's a bubble. And if I increase the pressure of that system, that bubble is going to shrink. When that bubble shrinks, there's now more room for the, for the liquid to take up. And you're effectively having a system where the walls are now expanding. And then third, although we're talking about water, and water is generally considered an incompressible material, it is, of course, not completely compressible. So as you increase the pressure of a system, then you expect that the, the density of that water to increase. You expect it to contract to some degree. <coughs> so as you're increasing the pressure, you have more room for the fluid to take up because the walls are expanding. 
more room for the fluid to take up because the bubbles are moving out of the way they're compressing, and more room for the fluid because the fluid itself is compressing <coughs> and taking up less volume. So all of these things combine to make this system not completely rigid. It all combines to allow us to have a different, ter a different flux term in uh, these transport equations. It basically says that this Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 equals zero term. It basically places a limitation on this aspect of the analysis. This analysis says, well, this is true as long as the volume of the system is not changing. But if the system changes, now we can have, uh, if, the, if the volume of the system changes, now we have to account for that when we keep track of all of the different uh, volumetric fluxes. And we can write this compliance as the differential change in the volume of the system as the pressure changes. <clears throat> now in this form, this looks pretty thermodynamic, and that's nice and all, but we're really interested in how systems like this change with time. So I want to take this and I want to turn it into a form that tells me how the system changes with time, and I want to do this with a view towards how I can link this back to analogies with electrical circuits. So if I assume that the pressure that I'm applying in this system is changing with time, <clears throat> and I multiply both sides of this by dp dt, I'm left with an equation that says that this compliance C, or this hydraulic capacitance, dp dt, is now given by dv dp times dv dt. This is equivalent to dv dt. Now, this change in volume of the system, you know, if I'm expanding the system, well, where does that expansion have to come from? It has to come from a flux in of the fluid. And this, so this dV dt can be thought of as a volumetric flux. And that leads me to this relation. So this relation now says that the volumetric flux associated with the change in the volume of the system is given by this compliance times the time rate of change of the pressure. And again, this is designed to be put in a form that is reminiscent of this relation, which is the relation for the current of a capacitor. <clears throat> so the current through a resistor is given by the voltage divided by the resistance. The current through a capacitor is given by the capacitance times the time rate of change of the voltage. And we have hydraulic analogies. The volumetric flow rate through a hydraulic resistor is given by the pressure difference divided by the hydraulic resistance. And the volumetric flux through a system that has compliance is given by a hydraulic capacitance times the time rate of change of the pressure. 